Good morning, and thank you again for joining us at the 2021 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Emily Johnson, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel, the Data Dangle Hockey Analytics. Our panelists today are Megan Chaika, CEO and co-founder of Statleads, Hillary Knight, professional hockey player and Olympic gold medalist with Team USA, and Alexander Mandricki, Director of Hockey Strategy and Research for the Seattle Kraken. Our panel will be moderated by John Buchigros, co-host of SportsCenter ESPN. The panel will run for 35 minutes and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please use the chat on the right side of the window for discussions during the panel and the Q&A option also on the right to submit questions for our panelists. You can also submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag PuckTalk. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. With that, I will turn it over to John. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, covering the Frozen Four for uh, the NCAA National Championship Hockey Tournament. Two games last night. The championship game is tomorrow, so I'm certainly in the hockey mode, and I'm uh, really pumped to be joined by three very smart women, much smarter than me. I'm the dumb guy of the group, so I'm going to do my best to learn and uh, to kind of go through you know, the world of analytics. We all use our gut at times. We had to when we were cave men and cave women, and we were trying to uh, survive out in the savannah. But as uh, life has gone on, we find out that there are biases, there are emotional responses to things, and we want to get the most accurate uh, assessment of ourselves, or a hockey player, when we buy a car or whatever it is, and we want information, and we want to kind of balance those things and certainly trust our gut, but also verify at the same time. And that's what we hope to do today. And uh, I want to start, Hillary, I kind of want to start with you, because obviously one of the most important things for people who really want analytics to be uh, you know, used and trusted and implemented, implemented, I think is a better word than used, uh, is attitudes by others. And in 2017, you talked about seeing both sides of the player's view. Uh, you know, there's one side, this guy's nuts. What are they talking about? It doesn't make any sense to me. And maybe others who have opened their minds since, since 2017 at this conference. I'm curious, what in your eyes and ears has changed in almost four years uh, from those talking about analytics? Yeah, well, I think you, you hit it on the head there. There's so many biases, right? And to be able to sift through all the information, whether that's the emotional responses or the actual data that we're collecting uh, from different games or from shifts, it's it's really important to provide a more accurate picture than just how you feel out there. And a lot of times, you know, as a player, you go out there, you're like, oh, I had a great shift. And then you rewatch it on film and um, <laughs> people get back to you, you're like, hey, you kind of turn the puck over there a bunch of times, but it just so happened to work out and create space for somebody else. So I think it's just, it's one of these secret weapons um, because we're now using it more widely. However, not all players are adopting it. Um, so it's something that can be a differentiator for top end players, for sure. But have you seen attitudes change at all? Is it evolving at all where players are being more acceptant of it? Where in the past, maybe it's like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I think there's some still some old school thought sure. surrounding it, right? That you're like, oh no, I don't want this to, you know, turn against my my chances of making it or making it big. But, um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a big part of what we do, and we want to maximize our performance, and and analytics is part of that. Uh, let's turn to Alexandra and Megan. And uh, Mark Scheifele made some news recently when he said, "quote To be honest, I don't have much time for analytics. You know, I don't pay any attention to it. And in some ways, you kind of get what he." saying from the standpoint that as you know hockey is an emotional game it's a blood sport sometimes you have to play with anger and a temper to to succeed because it's hard it's a difficult game there's many obstacles there's walls other players and a hard puck that goes 100 miles an hour so it's a difficult game so uh alexander we'll start with you you know what are some of the biggest challenges you face when you know when you're providing data to the players and teams and, and you understand that some people like mark Scheife, they're going to have emotional responses to that uh, you know, how do you deal with that? What, what are some of the biggest challenges? Well, I stay out of the locker room and, you know, I consider it, it's my job to inform the people that are interacting with those players. And most of the time that's the coach, right? And so you maybe, what you're going to say to a coach would be completely different as to how you would probably hope the coach would present data to a player, right? Like some players, maybe they would want to know the exact you know, likelihood of a shot going in from this pinpointing a location on the ice. But the coach is probably just going to say, hey, like get to the net, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's where the coach can be so powerful by taking the data and the insights and then translating into something that not just motivating all the players at once, but coaches understand how to get at different players and how they're motivated on the ice. Yeah. And I think, and I think you t- also, as you all know, athletes want to be coached hard. They want information. They want technique. And, uh, and they're also very self-critical. They tend to be perfectionists. I know Hillary, you're probably not in your head at that. We can, sometimes we hate ourselves. We talk in our heads, you know, we, we don't, we're not any good. I stink. And so if we can get information saying that it also, I think people look at it too, Megan, as a, not, a negative connotation. Here's what you did wrong. No, here's how I can help you and become a better player, make more money, provide for your family. You can use all kinds of techniques. Um, so what are ways for you, instead of just saying, these are all the bad things I hear, what can we do to tailor the message uh, to players and coaches? Well, and I think that's a bit of the issue with a Mark Shifley comment is you have to take into context what he's doing. He's at a press conference. He's answering to media. Of course, if you weaponize data and say, this is why you're bad, or this is why your team's not succeeding, you're not going to take it well. And I wouldn't either as a player. So I think it depends on how it's positioned. And like Alex said, how it's used in terms of like the insights and the information that players can take out of it. So I think one big area that a lot of players, especially the elite level players, like Hillary was saying, have used and done very well on the data and analytics side is player development. You know, working with, uh, you know, sports science coaches, uh, you know, on ice performance and figuring out areas of the game that like traditionally don't show up on the box score, but are very important for the entire team to play well and for you to reach your goals. So I think it's just a different perspective on how you use data and not just as like a pure performance metric in a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. Alexandra, I want to follow one, um, one more time with you. Um, you know, certainly the average person, average sports fan who's, you know, wants to get into this or doesn't understand it is ignorant to it. They, they look in the world of politics where people have a, they have a, a, an attitude about something and they tailor everything towards supporting what they believe in, whatever that issue is. And how do you avoid bias in statistical analysis when it, you might think this is the way to play, whether it's puck possession, whether it's doing this, but then you start to find some things like, boy, maybe we need to do it a different way, even though you think the original way is the correct way. So how do you deal with that? Uh, try to be an agnostic as you look at hockey and provide your data that you think is the correct one. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, data analysis, it always starts with asking a question. And so if you're asking the question of does puck possession matter, you're, you're, you're kind of biasing yourself a little bit, right? Because we, we're pretty sure it does. Um, but if you ask, like, I think something I really like to do with coaches is, you know, try to support one of their theories. You know, if they have some, like, you know, back in my day, we used to count hits in the defensive zone and that told us if we won the game or not, right? Like, mm-hmm. okay, well, let me go look at that. And, you know, maybe there's a little something there, Um uh, but it, get them on your side and then you can ask sort of another question that maybe is a little more thought provoking or insightful. Uh, it, and I, I do want to add something kind of on the sure. note of players uh, accepting or rejecting analytics. Like I think we get into this, you know, some players are bad and some players are good, but especially in the NHL, like we still need players to play. Like it's not as though we're going to stop paying players money if some like (laughs) analytics think players are bad or players are good um you know there's still a salary cap teams are probably still going to spend up to it like someone's going to get paid and so I think that's sort of a mind shift that maybe agents and players should understand is that we're ultimately like we're still going to be icing a team and people are still going to have jobs (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's talk about the player and puck tracking. We heard a lot about this in the NHL. It was slated to be the first full season with player and puck tracking technology. Uh, but then six days into the season, the league pulled tracking pucks due to complaints about their performance. Um, Megan, five of the leagues you work for have been using tracking data for a few years now. Can you tell us about the history of player and puck tracking and how you've seen it evolve? Yeah, and I mean, Sport Vision, which was bought by SMT, I think we met with them about nine years ago. So this has been a long journey in terms of figuring out where player and puck tracking goes. You know, it's mainly location data. Everything else is calculated, acceleration speed on top of that. Obviously, huge gaps in terms of like, you don't know where the stick is. 
you don't necessarily know orientation, but I would ask this to Hillary. Did you know you were tracked during the Olympics uh, by Omega and IHF? Did you get any of that data? We didn't get any of the data. However, we knew because there was a little uh, weight in the back of our jerseys in the back of the collar <laughs> area or between the shoulder blades. And then randomly on the Jumbotron, we'd see Kendall yeah. coming versus <laughs> speed. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's fast. Yeah. Well, and I saw your name up all the time. I look up and oh, Hillary Knight. So I'm not sure if the Koreans really clung to you as well as a, a big piece on the Olympic team. But, you know, of course, that's really cool that we had women's uh, tracking data four years ago already. Uh, we don't talk about that as enough as well. Um, so I think there's an element of, of course, locations are amazing and great information. There's a lot of other information with hockey that's, you know, hard to glean from it. And then you need really granular event type data. Uh, but with that said, I think, uh, you know, soccer does a great job in terms of, you know, the steps you need to take in terms of working with a player and puck tracking, passing, shooting, what that means in context where everyone's on the ice. And we've actually had location data at staff leads of every player uh, for the last couple of years. We have an internal software tool. The puck is very tricky. Uh, and I, obviously six games and the puck is continuing to be tricky. So mm -hmm. I think that's a problem that everyone uh, is looking to solve. But, you know, of course, more data is always better. Uh, gambling, gambling adjacent markets are super excited about it. So I just can't wait to see the acceleration of technology in general. Mm. Alexander, can you tell us uh, how the data generated from player puck tracking differs from existing data and how the team you work for, the Seattle Kraken, can use this data? Yeah, so as Megan said, you know, different vendors have been offering kind of sort of enriched data, right? Uh, teams right now, they're not just working with, you know, the shots and the hits and the takeaways and giveaways that you get from the NHL. Like really where there's value is supplementing that standard event data. And that's where, you know, the tracking data does come into play because all of a sudden you have maybe a better understanding of exactly where every player is on the ice certainly will be excited when we understand where the puck is on the ice as well. And, and I would say, I certainly can't speak for all teams, but this is very much an exploratory phase for us. Like we're looking to other sports, uh, you know, what they've been able to do with this data in the past and kind of beginning to formulate some analysis. analysis. But until we really have a season, two seasons, I think that's where you get into the predictive side of things, right? Like what, what does it mean if a player um, is accelerating X miles per hour, right? Uh, does that mean that they're good? <laughs> uh, that's kind mm -hmm. of the question, but certainly in the interim, I think there's a lot of applications for coaching, for broadcast. It's been amazing on broadcast this year and really looking forward to seeing how that's enhanced moving forward. Mm. Uh, this is for everyone. I'll start with you, Hillary. I'm kind of curious, you know, we're a traditional stat and a non-traditional stat that's overrated, underrated. Let's go with a traditional stat you think is overrated. The average fan might look at and say, that guy's good. Um, and which one underrated, if you can uh, differentiate? Why are you going to do me like this? I know. <laughs> be honest. We can't be anywhere, Hillary, unless we're open and honest with you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. Honestly, I couldn't really pinpoint. I think maybe, you know, maybe like the plus minus is one of the ones that people are like, oh, yeah, this person's great because of whatever. Or they're terrible because of all the minuses. Um, you know, that's kind of one that I think a lot of people hang their hat on. Um, yeah. And I'm sure the experts on this panel can can. Uh, <laughs> kind of steer well, this in the right way but that, that's that's a great point like uh, for alexandra and megan is plus minus accurate at all or is it who you play with fortune luck coincidence you're on the ice when a great player scores a defenseman who's on the ice when an offensive line's out there because they want some defensive presence he's going to be out there he might be 60 feet from the goal but he gets an award a star from the teacher uh so what about plus minus megan and alexandra yeah, I mean, if you're on the power play with Mitch Marner, who's a great passer, of course he's going to help you. And I think Hillary knows too, right? You get demoted to the fourth line, you get your minutes taken down. Plus minus is not really a good gauge of your worth. And that could be a coaching, that could be systems. There's so many different ways that that's impacted. So thank goodness that, you know, we have a ton more data that plus minus is basically useless. Yeah. All you right. Know, I was going to say to build off of that, we used to have a coach that was like, okay, if we get 60 shots, we're going to win the game. And you're like, 
well, if I take 60 shots from the oppo- opposite goal line, you know, I don't know how many of those are going to go in. Right. So then yeah. sifting through grade A's and what those opportunities look like. So it's really as good as what you can sift through and, and uh, what you're trying to gather from it. How about underrated Alexandra? I know, you know, a lot of statistics are really kind of simple one-on-one stuff for the average fan who works a job every day and tries to raise a family or has a hobby. You know, it's tough for them to go too deep. So I'm sure, and I'm sure you're one of your goals working with players and coaches is to make things simple, uh, you know, that people can consume and get quickly. The fewer words, the better. Uh, brevity, brevity, brevity. So what do you think is an, is an underrated stat that maybe me, the hockey fan, should be paying attention to? Um, it's a, an underrated public stat is a little bit maybe a different answer than I would say yeah. underrated. Well, well, you, you, <laughs> you, can go, you, you, you can go to a deep dive as well if, if you can't quite cite one, but if some of you kind of say, you know what, I believe in the stat. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what's tough and I think Hillary and Megan will agree with this, it's pretty hard to quantify defense, at least with the uh, stats that are available currently. Uh, and we know that kind of these, what you refer to as maybe like a stay at home defender. Like we know that some of those guys can be really impactful, um, to the game and, you know, maybe not in the traditional sense where you have kind of the big hulking guy on the back end who doesn't move up the ice at all, but kind of those puck movers that aren't showing up on the score sheet. You know, I think there's definitely stats that you can tease out and try to figure out who is ultimately advancing that puck to the offensive zone. Hmm. Uh, this is what I like this part of things as we look at personnel and analytics, you know, some people, I think I'm most people, I have a building brain, I like to build things, whether it's, uh, you know, just kind of start from scratch and then try to create something, whether it's a, like I said, whether it's a TV production, music video, uh, a fantasy team, or in your case, Alexander, a real team, um, you know, as the NHL faces a flat cap the next few years because of the pandemic and obviously the drop in revenues, uh, how do you use analytics to build your roster? Like, how is there a, you know, take it in balance? Do you like to balance things? It's good like to go inside your brain and figure out what the Kraken are doing and what, what what's a, a useful and efficient way to build something using data. Yeah, well, I'm not about to tell everyone who we're picking in the expansion True. here. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think what the point that really needs to be made is there isn't like one stat that we create that we just order the whole league by and then say, okay, we're going to pick the best player that's available kind of by that stat um, to formulate the Kraken. You have to think, as you said, roster balance, um, you know, handedness. Uh, playmaker versus someone who's going to sit by the net and you know ultimately we have to score some goals right Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think that that's just what I would say is it's it's tricky and there's a lot of factors at play but that's why we have the analytics that's why we have the scouts that's why we have Ron Francis and the rest of our management team but you know I, I think the Kraken strength has been we we have one of the bigger sort of analytics staffs in the league we've built out what we think is a pretty robust sort of player evaluation system. And ultimately we're doing a great job sort of surfacing that information alongside what our scouts are thinking and what management's thinking and providing the tools that when Ron's sitting down and making GM calls um, over the next few months, and when we're sitting in the room and making our expansion picks, you know, we're basically as informed as possible. Uh, just make sure we're making the best decisions. And then balancing back to the player, Hillary, you know, do you think there's an element of the game that, you know, could never be captured through analytics that you need to, you might try to explain to someone who's uh, offering you some, some data? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it, as we figure out a way to quantify things, it becomes hopefully a little bit easier on, on the uh, back end, but um you know, hockey is such a dynamic sport, right? But I think as we develop these different ways to, to gather, um, data points, it's just, it's going to be incredible, uh, what we can, what we can bring back to the table and how we can evaluate players and as players, like how we can evaluate our game and and look to improve. So for me, it's extremely exciting. Um, you know, I love the space where the wearables kind of combine with all, all these other data points that we're gathering, uh, from a personal development standpoint as well. 
Hmm. Goalies are so good, uh, Megan, Alexandra. You know, we want to get them out of position. That's how you can really score goals in the NHL. And that's kind of you know something like I admit I never really thought about. What kind of data, what kind of information can you provide the players? Start with you, Megan, that maybe can get a goalie out of position. Like, what can they do? And how can you and how do you offer that besides well, just like- saying if it was that easy in the NHL, they'd score all the time. And I think <laughs> right. that's, the, that's the problem is that a set goalie, especially at that level. And look at Team USA. I mean, with Hillary, they're stacked with great goalies too. It's very challenging to score on a goalie, a seizure shot that's covering the majority of the net. You know, from our data, we know how much of the net a, a scorer can see or a shooter can see. We can calculate expected goals. We have 150 plus variables that go into the expected goal calculation. And you are correct that goalie is a huge driver of scoring, their positioning, where they are, if they're down and out, if they're moving, how they make saves, RVH, VH, what their positioning is. All of that's incredibly important, not really collected at all with player and puck tracking. So we are really focused on figuring out goalie movement and what's going on there, because those are metrics that I think, you know, have never been available beyond like people charting it, you know, on a pad and and scouts trying to figure out who will perform at a higher level. Is it a smaller goalie that's faster? Is it a bigger goalie that takes up the net? Uh, We see success from both sides in the NHL. Alexandra, how would you like to see non-traditional stats applied on multimedia platforms? I think that's part of it. Again, I know you primarily, you want the crack in the wind game to get good players, but what can we do again to get to viewers, to get to consumers, to get to others? To, uh, to consume it, like I said, in a simple fashion that will help enhance the game for them, their viewing pleasure uh, as well. I know, again, that's maybe not primarily your focus, but again, you, you might, I'm sure there's situations you see, we can explain this better. Are there examples of that? Well, this, this may be a little bit of a hot take, but even just on the face right. I love having the names above the players. I mean, honestly, when you're watching games from way up high, if I could just like wear some smart glasses that I could mm-hmm. uh, see, who is who on the ice and not have to constantly, I don't have the numbers memorized the same way all of our scouts do when I'm watching other teams. So uh, I I mean, I love that. And I think especially for the casual fan, you know, making sure that, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone knows who Connor McDavid is when Connor McDavid is on the ice because of what he looks like, but, you know, popping that over his head uh, might be useful to start building that name recognition that I think, hockey maybe our stars are lacking compared to other sports uh, you know and I love the breakdowns that are you know just following kind of the play around uh, yeah. after a play and in between intermissions truly like explaining to fans what was happening on the ice because as someone who I, I actually didn't even start watching hockey until uh, 2000 nine uh, so like I didn't grow up with the sport and I remember when I was just beginning. I had no idea what was going on. To me, it was just like a bunch of fast men going up and down the ice. Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) that I think is what a lot of new fans probably feel as well. Yeah. I remember NASCAR first did that when guys would go around the lap and have, you said those moving icons above the car arrowing down who they are. And I know it's tough sometimes in hockey because it's a cluttered game, but I agree. Even if you pick two guys, one guy on each team, Hedman McDavid, and we can talk about the coaches matching lines and you could kind of follow them a bit. And like I said, and obviously we see miles per hour and things like that. I'm sure they're still working on it. And I, like I said, that that's something I like. Now, maybe not every brain does, but I agree. I, I kind of like those IDs. Uh, Megan, can you talk about some of the more innovative things you've helped teams and leagues do with data? Maybe this is something I know you're, you, you have a creative side of your brain and, and you like to kind of think, how can, how can we do this to help people consume this? Well, and I think that's the lucky thing that I have where I'm not siloed with a team or a certain league. You know, we work across 22 leagues, so I'm able to pull out a lot that goes on, whether it's overseas or at the Olympics. Like I said, Hillary already had tracking data four years ago. Uh, And Europe and Russia are huge footprints for hockey. You know, we underestimate the reach of our game, and we typically talk about the other three North American sports as if they're super dominant. But, you know, you go to Finland, and I went to the Worlds in Finland with the women's final. It's It was massive. It was completely packed arena. Um, so I think you're right. I think we'll see a lot more overlays. Netflix has a really neat feature where you can actually hover and see, you know, who's on the screen at the time. Uh, we're currently developing that technology for every single video clip that we 
ever have for the NHL. So certain areas that allow you to sit back and watch the game and enjoy if you want that or completely engage and immerse yourself in data. I think you should have both options, especially as we see the rollout of fantasy and, and sports betting come to North America very heavily. Right. And that's like you said, you, you, you mentioned that earlier, Megan, that that aspect as gambling becomes in the United States more and more legal in every state, it's going to be more and more part of the broadcast. And obviously I'm interested in that ESPN just getting the NHL rights for seven more years. Like I said, I'm doing the college hockey championship tomorrow. And, and I want to look at the game and, and obviously our analysts want to look at the game in a way that is different, unique. I'm almost revolutionary. You know, we, we hear occasionally a, a, an area go into that. And for all three of you, I'm kind of curious with that in mind and something maybe I can steal and use on the broadcast tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what area, I'll, go, I'll start with you, Hillary. What areas of the game do you think will be the biggest focus of hockey analysis uh, in the future to help freshen it up, keep it new, and also obviously to evolve it into something better? Yeah, no, I think I think just providing different uh, ways to view the game in, in a non-traditional um, landscape, I guess, is the best way to that I would love to see the sport grow. Um, and you mentioned bringing different types of metrics to the broadcast. I think that's brilliant. Um, a lot of these people, you know, are used to the the e-gaming platform. So maybe potentially having something that resembles that in, in some respect, um, the, yeah. the anticipation of betting, getting added into it. It's just, there's really exciting, um, you know, landscape for the sport. And I think what's great about it is hockey so dynamic. So it feels like there's endless amounts of things to measure, right. which is really cool. Yeah. What about you, Megan? The biggest focus of hockey analysis uh, in the future, maybe we're not thinking about now. Yeah. And like Hillary said, I think hockey actually has more opportunity to storytell. And I think you have to, you know, answer the why, like Alex said, like, what's your question and why? Because I see a lot of rankings or different types of lists and there's no context behind them. You know, is five to 10 really close together? Is there a huge chasm where Connor McDavid is amazing at rush situations and the rest are not, which is a uh, allusion to my last talk at MIT where yes he's like number one but then everyone else was sort of you know kind of packed beside him where they were very interchangeable and I think telling those stories with data that there is some uncertainty that you know not every model is perfect and really getting to the audience why this matters to them I think if you can answer that question with data that's far more compelling than just any sort of like number on the screen. Alexander, take us inside what's going on uh, at, you know, in your brain and the Kraken's brain about the biggest focus of hockey analysis. Are there things, and again, you don't want to give away your secrets. I mean, let's face it, you're trying to win a Stanley Cup, but uh, are there areas and what are you think they might be that um, people can look for? Muted myself. I think I've uh, okay. alluded to this a little bit, but just kind of the uh, maybe less obvious. Yeah, I think we focus a lot on you know, first in the advanced analytics journey, we were thinking about shots and then we were thinking about Corsi and now it's kind of like expected goals. But, you know, now I think we're moving with some, you know, like data from athletes or data from these other vendors, this puck and tracking data. Now we can kind of just say like, what's expected when you're at any given point on the ice? Like how powerful, like what does that pass lead to? Because that helps you score a goal, right? Advancing that puck off the ice. And I think with so many events from vendors like Staff Leaves, from the NHL, with this puck and tracking data, like any single thing that happens in the game, we can figure out how useful it was. What about negotiating contracts, Alexandra? Uh, well, agents, certainly when they invented the save in baseball, it made a lot of players rich beyond their wildest dreams before they calculated saves and defined it, gave it a definition. Um, which is, of course, subjective. What about contracts and using data for the agent to get more money or for you to say, you know, actually we see this as your value? Yeah, well, first I'll say with all the tracking data that's been sort of excluded from any sort of salary arbitration or uh, like contract negotiation. So that will not be used uh, either against, but I also wanna say for a player, right? Like data can sometimes be good. Um, yes. Not just uh, evil. But I think you see it in, in my time, I was with the Minnesota Wild previously, so I have worked for a real team. And uh, you saw like some agents, if the player looked good by some advanced metric, they would try to talk about it. And if the player didn't look good, they wouldn't, right? And so it's all about kind of supporting your case of this player's value. And, you know, I do think ultimately 
salary negotiations are based on just what the market is going to pay you. And so Mm -hmm. as um, teams maybe prioritize different things, you may see players that look better by some of these more advanced metrics, but maybe less so by a traditional goals assist points, maybe they will get paid more. Megan, what advice do you have for people in the audience watching this today who are you know, interested in this topic, building a career in it? Uh, is it a good career to go into? What are the positives, negatives? What's the growth potential? And of course, you touched on that with gambling. That's probably where it becomes really unlimited and maybe the secret sauce for this career and, and to come up with something and invent something on your own. What's your advice to people tuning in just because of their interest in this area? Well, I don't think there's ever been a better time. You know, the only better time to start than 10 years ago or 12 years ago when I did is now. Uh, But I would also say that it's like a wide variety of disciplines, like the more technical you are, I think the more opportunity you will have. So engineering, computer science, physics, you know, you don't have to come from just one area to be a data scientist or a data engineer, or there could be even, you know, jobs in five years that I don't even know, we don't even know as a panel about. So Mm -hmm. I would say don't limit yourself in terms of what you think your career is going to be, you know, write papers, do open competitions. I know they had a hackathon with DraftKings for this. I actually ran a big data cup hackathon. I did half women's data, half men's data. Um, And I think too, with, you know, scouts not being able to be in arenas or travel, no one has wanted data more. Now there's just, you know, these companies, my company has just been expanding incredibly this year. So I would say get involved in any way you can, you know, take as many of those hard classes that you maybe want to avoid (laughs) as you can (laughs) learn as many coding skills, you know, the second and third language always gets a bit easier. So, you know, there's a lot of good getting started in analytics uh, talks and, and tips out there. I would just say, yeah, begin today. So uh, is it smart to get pucks deep? That's what, I think that's what America and Canada need, need to know. Is there, it, does that uh, equal success or help success in, the, uh, in hockey? Go first, Megan. Is it, sorry, what, what was your question? Is it you know, the possible? Old, the, old, yeah, the old get pucks deep narrative. Oh, get pucks oh. deep. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think Alex sort of alluded to that and maybe for working for a team, she doesn't want to talk as much about certain models, but, you know, it depends where you're on the ice. Obviously, the closer to the net you are, uh, probably the more opportunity you will, you will have to score. So that's kind of like the traditional, you know, all the things came for, for certain reasons, but that doesn't, doesn't mean if you just, d- you know, dump and chase that, you know, you're going to recover the puck. And I think that's the, right. the zone entry sort of problem is yes, you can't carry over the puck hundred percent of the time people will know and be able to then counter that. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to dump it 80, 100 percent of the time, either get putts deep because you probably won't get it back that often. So mm-hmm. there are certain strategies and things that we've learned from analytics to change a bit of that dynamic of what are like traditional sayings or what you hear from a player, you know, after the game. Uh, but certainly the closer to the net you are, the more chaos you can uh, create with the goalie, probably the higher expected goals, expected threat you'll have from passing and shooting. Hillary, is there any way you connect with uh, analytics off the ice? Like, can you tailor your training if they find out, you know, okay, they need, I need to accelerate more. So I'll do some more fast twitch exercises. Have you, has it gotten that evolved yet for your off ice training? Yeah, well, I'm hoping more opportunities for the analytics and and, um, data presentation come to the women's side more so. But, you know, just something as simple as working with a uh, skating coach and seeing, okay, you know, the Connor McDavid's, the Barzels, the, you know, you name it, are doing these crossovers, right? And how the D has to match the positioning on the ice to receive uh, that one-on-one opportunity or the two-on-one opportunity and creating chaos in front of them. So there are different things that we're taking away from the NHL side and we are applying to our training, uh, which Mm. has been fantastic. I wish I had this like 10, 20 years ago, right? But um, you know, it's wonderful to look at the game through a different lens um, and also be receptive to feedback because you want to be better. Is, is, are there, in uh, Alexander, are there unique ways you can track the women's game or the men's game? Are they exactly the same? Uh, how can women use these tools better for their own sake and growing their game? And obviously the, 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 the biggest market to grow sports is, is really the women's sports all across uh, all across the landscape. They're the ones that are pr- probably the, the biggest chance for big growth is can you differentiate that way? Uh, I mean, I think what's amazing kind of about 
uh, using technology to scout in some ways and collect data is that we can transfer it to other leagues. And so I think uh, I don't want to speak for what sort of staff leads has done, uh, Megan, on your behalf. But, you know, I think being able to apply, hey, we have this system to track data and take in video and digest and output a data set. Like, why aren't we doing it for the women's game? And Megan, I'll, maybe I'll let you jump on that. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I worked the, the full Olympics, so I have all of Hillary's data from that, as well as the World Championship in Finland, which they pulled off. And it was just the craziest game I've ever been to. I will say that. Um, and I actually try as a company to do at least 10 to 20 percent of women's games. And I don't just think of that as like, oh, I'm advertising or marketing. I think of that as it's good for the game. You know, there's a lot of women that love the NHL, and I think there's an equally amount of women and men that want to watch women's hockey and just don't have the access. So I actually published a lot of the NWHL tournaments data for people to work with, and 50% of them that submitted for my competition worked with women's data because it was unique, it was interesting, it was fresh. So as you're saying, John, I think the market is huge. I think women's sports, sports teams are very undervalued right now, right? The valuations are far less than these, these men's teams. So now is the time to invest in women's sports. Yeah, you wonder how that's going to, uh, you know, from the financial side, people, players or owners or uh, people buying women's sports teams because they're bullish and they see the growth potential. I think that's going to be an interesting side, for, especially in my business, to kind of observe and see what happens along that line. Um, speaking of publishing data for people to work with, what access uh, do you have to competitor data? Is that a thing, uh, Alexandra and Megan? I guess by competitor data, I'm not quite sure uh, what's intended, but certainly, you know, we have access to like the puck and player, or the player tracking data right now. Any sort of data feed that we're getting from a vendor is gonna show maybe both sides of the puck where you kind of have maybe your own internal data would be related to more of the sports science side of things. So if you have players, Hillary's alluded to a few times, maybe you have a wearable during practice that's uh, trying to monitor training load, uh, you would have that information about your own players, but not the other players. I guess too, yeah. Megan, like when you're, when you're scouting an opponent, can you use you whether, you know, data to help that part of the, of the process? And that's probably more important because I think, right. especially in the NHL, you know, your team, I mean, they're brilliant. They, their minds can whirl a million times. And when we originally went to build any sort of system, we sat down with like the best Stanley cup winning coaches and GMs. And we're like, how do you see the game? How do you break it down? What matters to you? What lens are you looking through and try to basically create systems that mirrored. So like an AI of someone that's in hockey's brains. Now, unfortunately they can't watch 2000 games a day, you know, a, a day or, or a year or 10,000 games a year, which you need to do scouting. So that's where data and analytics comes into play. Sure. The best scout in the world can probably do a better job with 200 games, but he can't with 10,000. Uh, mm. So you need to supplement what they're doing and have them focus on, you know, who you really want to look at and what you're evaluating. Uh, but I would say, you know, I think in hockey, we talk about like these catch all solutions and we see in other sports that there's a ton of vendors doing all sorts of different things that provide different data. I don't even know how many they have in baseball now, right? You have Hawkeye, you have StatCast, you have, you know, whatever else MLBAM runs. So the more data, the better, the more accuracy, the better, you know, that's totally what we're focused on because as more people jump in the pool, you know, technology doesn't necessarily uh, work the way they want to sometimes. So, you know, efficiency, accuracy, I think has to be number one for anyone that's working with hockey data. Alexander, you were involved in the hiring process for Ron Francis. Uh, how can teams use analytics not only to make player personnel decisions, but can you use it for off-ice personnel decisions as well in building your organization? Yeah, that was uh, kind of interesting coming into Seattle before we had actually hired a general manager. And I think what I'll say that the challenging part of evaluating someone based on their personnel decisions is, as you know, when you're in an NHL organization or any sport organization, for every like 5,000 decisions that you contemplate making, you're going to make one of them, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes maybe the person's value is in the moves that they didn't make, or maybe they really thought something was a good idea, but for whatever reason, the signing didn't pan out or the trade didn't pan out. 
So I think it's tough. I don't know that I would be able to give like every GM in the league, a GM score or a coach in the league, a coach score. But I, you know, I think data and looking at sort of the history of maybe decision-making would allow for a thought provoking sort of interview um, and that sort of thing. Alexandra, are there metrics you leverage in scouting to identify players who are potentially underperforming due to who they're playing with, you know, a winger with a center who's performing badly for a few reasons. Uh, are you able to identify maybe someone? And again, that's what a lot of this is, as you know, coming up with a, something that, Hey, that's an important stat. And most people don't see that. Uh, how can you do that? Yeah. I think we look at, you know, the context of everything surrounding the player on the ice. So whether that's who they're playing with, who they're playing against, what, you know, is someone better on the left wing or the right wing? Are they playing out of, you know, out of position, same thing for defensemen. And we can kind of quantify all of those factors and get at, you know, both what is a player's impact been, but then perhaps the most important question, especially for the Seattle Kraken is what would the player's impact be sort of outside of their current context? Cause that's what we have to do basically is we're going to be taking 30 players from different teams and, you know, plucking them in Seattle. They've never played together before probably and uh, hope that it works. Hillary, what's some data you wish you had, either on yourself or your opponent, that you think uh, could have helped? Do you ever think about that as you you look at your game? All the time. Well, I wish I had endless amounts of uh, data on myself so I could just critique it, but then I'd probably just be sitting in a closet all day working on that. (laughs) um, No, I think the goaltender, it's, um, you know, I think Megan alluded to it, is the the reverse VH, the VH, you know, what's working, what isn't working. Um, I know last night on your broadcast, you were talking about getting the goalie, not being able to see the puck and the puck just having eyes of its own, right? So it's just... If you want to score goals, you need to analyze the goalies, right? And try to oh, put yourself yeah. in a position to get there. So um, I think probably that would be something, an area of focus that I look at moving forward. What about that, Megan? Stats you can use to help your game if you're a player. Yeah, I mean, I think it's endless. Like we were talking about in this segment, you know, I think um, obviously traditionally the box score uh, shows players that are are scoring, right? They show players that are are producing on offense, but you really want to know, you know, who's the defensive forwards, what are defensemen doing, stay at home defensemen, you know, people that, you know, they play well if you watch the game and you know that that they've contributed, but maybe they don't show up on the box score very rarely. So those type of data and information models, I think, are, are really relevant and tying that to video clips where then you can, you know, instruct them of what worked, what didn't work, where you think pre-scout the other team, you know, who their matchups will be, who they have to stop, who they're shutting down that game. You know, we see that in the playoffs as well, really close chippy games. You know, those defensive forwards that shut down a Sidney Crosby, you can't pay them enough. You can't, you know, they they win Stanley Cups for you. So I think that has to be looked at through advanced data, not just the, the box score outs. You know, you're just guessing um, most of the time. And and some, you know, teams get lucky and, and these, these defensive forwards just develop into it. But I think with data, you'll have a huge, uh, you know, competitive advantage finding them early. Is there a future in which athletes can own and monetize their data, perhaps through an opt-in, opt-out collective uh, agreement, Megan? Yeah, and I was talking that to that with Hillary on our pre-call. I know you were wearing a whoop, and what was your ring? Uh, the aura ring. So, okay. so there you go, right? He, she was, had two things that were tracking all sorts of other metrics. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a world where, especially in women's sports, where there isn't such a, you know, players association, and strict rules where there's, you know, not really um, that framework. I think that they have a lot more that they can do that's creative and interesting, that engages fans, that tells their story, right? They're, you know, we don't realize how, you know, powerful and amazing Hillary is as an athlete because we don't get to see it as much in the media. So I think data will tie that to women's sports a lot more and opening that up and making it more open source would be really cool. All right, one minute remaining the period, one minute. Give me a hot take. Give me a headline. Give me a strong belief from each of you about, uh, you know, basically what we talked about, or you can veer off an exit ramp if it, if it at least aligns a little bit. <laughs> Hillary, I'll start with you. Hot take, opinion, preach, girl. Oh, 
embrace data. It's here and it's the future of the sport. Um, mm -hmm. As players, we're excited about it. And, you know, I think there's there's an avenue where we can monetize our data from a player's perspective. But uh, from a development level, it's 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 the future of the game. So hop on board. That sounds like everything there. Monetize and use. Alexandra, what do you think? I think I'll just say that data is only as powerful as the way you present it. So I think at the end of the day, that's the most important thing when you interact with coaches, fans, whatever. No doubt. Uh, you want people to consume it and use it. And otherwise, it, if you don't do that well, it's a bunch of noise and it won't help anybody. And uh, Megan, the word is yours. The final word <laughs> is yours. Let's burn this house down. Let's go. Well, I think hockey data and analytics and marrying it with the ESPN contract, I think we're coming after you, Stephen A. Smith, and the NFL. I think we're going to be a number one sport in the USA. I think we're the best in arena product. We just got to marry the media, and I think we'll take over. Can I get an amen? <laughs> That's awesome. I love that kind of emotional, spirited finish. Uh, man, this was fun. Alexandra, Megan, and Hillary, uh, you guys are all awesome. Thanks so much for having me. And I really enjoyed this. And uh, I can't wait, as you said, Megan, for the future and see how this all comes together. Peace to you all.